Thank you, Dr. Beam, and thank you uh, for our first panel for a great start to today's symposium. It's my pleasure to introduce my colleague, uh, the Vice President of Sports Medicine for the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee, Mr. Dustin Nabhan. Dustin is a, a proud University of Arizona Wildcat and a proud Kofa High School King. Um, he has been an incredible peer in creating innovative uh, partnerships with regional medical facilities all over the United States and importantly, identifying opportunities to support Team USA athletes in preventative medicine. So Dustin, please lead the Q&A. Thank you, Charlie, and uh, go Kofa Kings. So we have some uh, great questions that uh, came from the audience. And uh, Dr. Barr, the first question is for you, if you could please unmute yourself. And I should mention to the group that uh, Dr. Beam was not able to join us today. Dr. Barr, you talked about the current state of your screening and monitoring programs. Can you talk to us about what you think the future looks like? Well, I think, I, I guess the holy grail of uh, this uh, area um, is um, a system where you put all the information you collect on the athlete, including all the medical information we have from screening, <clears throat> including the, the, the data we get from monitoring tools, um, adding all the low data, um, adding everything the athlete does, how he sleeps, uh, um, his, uh, his relationships with his family, his moods. Um, yeah, throw everything into a smart computer um, and out comes the number that says that, uh, well, today you should reduce your training by 50% uh, or now it's safe to train really, really hard. Um, I think we're uh, quite away, uh, away from that goal um, yet. Um, but um, and, and there are a number of reasons for that. Uh, but I get, I guess that is what we're all hoping for that we can, that we can use these data live uh, in order to to uh, to help the athlete uh, plan his or her training program. Professor Barr, uh, we are on the quest for the Holy Grail with you, and, and we hope one day that that, that is possible. Uh, while we have you on on microphone and camera, um, can you discuss what you're doing to return athletes to training after COVID in uh, Norway and maybe what your friends in Europe are doing? Well, I, I can speak for Norway. Um... Our Norwegian Olympic Training Center, as yours, uh, was closed on uh, March 12th when Norway went into to lockdown. Uh, that means uh, all the things that you're doing as well, working from home uh, and so on and so forth. Um, we have um, then been able to, uh, to open the center for restricted uh, training. Uh, in other words, a, a, a fixed number of people uh, in the room, uh, or in the rooms, I should say. Uh, so basically, we have the capacity now of, of allowing 12 athletes to train in our facilities at the same time. Um, they observe social distancing. Uh, there are um, very strict uh, disinfecting uh, routines in place before and after uh, each athlete leaves. Um, so at the moment, we're allowing limited training, individual training, our facilities, but no team trainings. Our handball team cannot train as a team. Throwing a ball and catching a ball is not uh, is, is still out of the question. Um, and we also have uh, been able to move into a phase where uh, where small teams are sequestered, uh, so living together, uh, all healthy, going into the program. Uh, living together, training together, um, and with minimal contact with the outside world. And I think that is the step that we're exploring now for more and more teams, uh, move them into one facility, keep them away from the world, um, but let them train more uh, normally. Uh, we, we still haven't been able to open swimming pools, so that's, uh, that's uh, still out uh, from, uh, from our side. Dr. Finn, thank you, uh, Professor Barr. I think we'll follow that with a COVID return to training uh, question for Dr. Finnoff. Can you talk similar to what Professor Barr just spoke about the um, some of the housing um, complications that this causes? 
Can you talk in detail about how we're managing the return to living at training centers and training sites? Yes, uh, thank you, Dustin. Essentially, we are, with returning to the Olympic and Paralympic training sites, we're going to be uh, bringing athletes in, and they're, they're coming from all over the country. And so some places will have a low risk of COVID-19, and others will have a high prevalence of COVID-19. And therefore, we're going to have to assume that they've been uh, exposed uh, and may actually even be currently uh, contagious um, without even knowing it. So when they arrive, we're going to certainly do symptom checks and temperature checks, but we are also going to test them upon entering our facility um, to see if they currently have an infection. We're not using serology because at this point, serology tests are difficult to interpret. They're more for research purposes, specifically epidemiology and not for clinical decision making. And we're going to be using PCR tests with uh, mucus swabs from the nasopharynx. Um, if they are negative, then they are entered into the Olympic and Paralympic Training Centers and they are kept in that uh, protected unit where it's cleaned and they're separate from the public. So very similar to what Dr. Barr was talking about. Um, for those that are in the, uh, that are not going to be training in the Olympic and Paralympic Training Centers, I think that Dr. Barr is exactly right. You should have them uh, in an area where there's a low prevalence of COVID-19 in the community. They should be housed together, uh, you know, preferentially they don't um, have interactions with the public. So food is delivered, they keep their area clean, they train in their small group, um, and that minimizes the risk of infection. But despite all of these measures, there is still potentially a uh, risk of infection. We can't completely eliminate that. Thank you, Dr. Finoff. Our next question is for Bahadi. Bahadi, can you tell us about the mental health resources available to Team USA athletes during the COVID crisis? Yes. Uh, thanks, Dustin. Hello to everyone. So yes, during this time, we have gotten with our medical team and also our external task force to come up with ways that we can address mental health challenges that may be occurring with our athletes during this time. So one of the first things we did was we expanded our comm psych resources. So uh, traditionally, comm psych resources have been available for athletes who are under the EAHI uh, insurance of the USOPC. But we understood during this time with the disruption to an athlete's schedule and the, also with the postponement of the games, that there could be significant stress that would occur within, within our athlete population. We wanted to make sure that those resources were available to all of our athletes. Uh, Dr. Finoff and uh, his team and the task force and our internal working group have also been diligently working to identify additional resources in the mental health and wellness space that would help assist our athletes. And we've seen greater engagement from our sports psychology staff on the sports performance side that can help athletes because they have those relationships that are vital to our athletes being taken care of, not only on the field of play, but off the field of play as well. So there, there are, we will continue to look at ways that we can address and improve in those areas, but we've taken some significant steps right off the bat that not only will address where we are in this crisis, but will set us up to have improved mental health resources in the future. Uh, Dr. or Professor Barr, we have another question for you. Are mental health conditions monitored in your program that you use with Norwegian athletes? That's an, that's an excellent question. Um, so the answer is in terms of our medical monitoring partly, in the sense that we, we do specifically include mental well-being in the question that they're asked weekly from the, from the app uh, that they get from the, from, from, from the medical department. Uh, but more important uh, is that uh, we also have a separate psychology department where uh, the psychologists are responsible for teams or groups of athletes and work very closely with them also on a day-to-day -day basis. So particularly in the situation with the postponement of, uh, of the Tokyo Games, um, the, the, our, our team of psychologists uh, are in constant contact with all the athletes uh, on the long candidate list uh, for, for Tokyo 
Um, and, and of course, there are those who struggle, uh, whether it's uh, about uh, uh, financial insecurity, whether it's a question of uh, do I do another year, um, uh, especially athletes uh, towards the end of their career. Uh, they're faced with some difficult choices now, uh, and some need help to reorient themselves uh, into perhaps thinking differently about the next year than they um, than 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 the goal that they had in in July uh, this year. Thank you, Professor Barr. So we're going to end this session. Thank you, everyone, for the literally hundreds of questions that were contributed um, to the session. Hopefully, we'll see more of the same uh, in the next symposium. And now we're going to kick it over to Charlie, who is going to take us to the break. Charlie, are you ready? Yes, thanks, Dustin. And thanks, panel number one. Outstanding content. Uh, a couple quick shout outs before we go into the break. We have several participants from the United States Air Force Academy on the uh, on the line, and also Alexander Lane from West Point is on the line. So thank you to the service academies. Remember, we are Team USA. So thank you for joining us today. Um, a reminder: post questions, uh, post questions, and you could potentially have one of these if you post questions. Um, trivia polling will start during the break. Please participate in the trivia polling. And also, you're seeing a trailer on the uh, on the screen about a possibility to make a donation. In order for Spry and the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Foundation to expand sports medicine and research capabilities, private funding is critical. So appreciate anybody's consideration of making a donation. And the information is on the screen. Uh, go to spryvale.org and you can donate to both organizations. So you have eight minutes. Enjoy the break.